Welcome to Clockworks, a Legion podcast. I'm Paul Moffat. I'm Jan Moffat. And this is Clockworks. Orange, you glad we're back to record a Clockworks? What? It's Clockworks. Orange, you glad that we're here? Clock it's still okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. Clockwork Orange. Yeah, there is a reference to that in this one. <laughs> <sighs> so we're talking this week about chapter 14 of Legion. We're calling this episode, I Am Superman. This episode was written by Noah Hawley alone, without Nathaniel mm-hmm. Halpern credited on this episode. Mm-hmm. It was directed by John Cameron. This is John Cameron's first episode directing Legion. John Cameron has five directing credits to his name. One is a short film that he did in the 80s. One, he directed one episode of Xena, one episode of Hercules, one episode of Fargo, and one episode of Legion. All right, then. Uh, But he has many assistant director credits, including on Army of Darkness, The Hudsucker Proxy, Men in Black. He's uh, worked with Sam Raimi several times. Cool. Yeah. So do you want to take us through this episode? Yes, I do. And before I just kind of launch into the beat by beat, as we know, this is kind of an a weird episode, to say the least. An, an, an atypical episode of Legion, which is normally such a very typical Exactly. Show. Such a very easy to follow show. Yeah. But I just want to break down a little bit the different Davids that we see so I can just kind of refer to them. Because we see like, okay, so I call them Coffee David, who gets the coffee. Mustache David, who is the young mustachio David. Rich David. Old Homeless David and Young Homeless David, Suburbs David, Scabby David, Bald Old David, and File Cabinets David. All right. There are a couple more, but those are the kind of just so I can refer to them as different different Davids that we see. Are there more? Yeah. Okay. We see a physics teacher David as well. Oh, right, right. That's right. We do. So let's just get into this bananas episode (laughs) okay take it away in a city we see an alley full of people in tents and shacks an old david sits by the fire we flash to a mansion with a a woman smoking a bong in a pool while rich david stands on a balcony in a kitchen old amy serves old bald david pea soup helps him brush his teeth put him to bed and give him medicine a young homeless david sits on a bench with Amy's face on it. Well, David and Amy drive past him. Walking past them is a suited David, Coffee David, carrying coffees to an office. He hears the thoughts of his co-workers and helps his boss, Laura, avoid making a bad deal by reading the minds of those around him. On the street, old homeless David digs for garbage, pushes a shopping cart, and talks to himself. At a dairy... Mustache David has a job stacking boxes. Amy phones him to remind him to take his pills, which he does. And then, in a diner, a scabby David uses his fries to talk about multiple realities to his friend, showing each different showing different options for life but each of them is shown, including a suburban life with kids. So that's just the first part. There's a lot to... Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot to take apart there. First thing, I really like the score in the first part of this episode mm. quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff Russo's score is always very evocative. Uh, I really like what he's doing in the opening moments of this episode. Yeah. Do you notice that there are crickets? Yes, I did notice. In the music at the beginning of this episode. Which, of course, is a callback to the first season and crickets as part of the score of Legion. There's a lot of callbacks in this episode. There's a lot of direct flashbacks, not really in the part that you just talked about, but this is once again. And we talked about this in the last episode, that there's a lot of looping and callbacks and 
and this episode, it feels like even more. There's clips and flashbacks and callbacks and echoes and recurring things that have happened before, and we're mm -hmm. looking at them differently. Yes, from or a very with a different... new perspective. Yeah, from a very different perspective this time around, and from a perspective of like what is real and what is not. Yeah. And I mean, we just kind of take this episode as what it is. What it is, is David seeing the multiple realities that his life could have gone, right? Like, that's just kind of how we have to take it. Seeing or experiencing? Seeing or experiencing, unclear. There's a moment where Rich, when they first show Rich David, and he's standing in this glass balcony, and you see a reflection behind him of him where you can't see that he's holding on to something. And so it's a very, like, this power stance with his arms out. And it reminds me of, like, all the times when he's manifested his power. Mm -hmm. Is that he feels like he just, like, has power. Yeah. That Rich David is very powerful. He absolutely is. And his hair, like, his styling... Makeup and styling is so comic booky. Mm -hmm, <laughs> His exactly. hair looks like a helmet, and you, you said this off mic, but uh, when we first watched it, but his hair kind of looks like a Magneto helmet. Mm -hmm. I don't think. I mean, maybe it is. I don't think it's deliberately a specifically a Magneto reference. No, I don't think so. But it is like this power helmet hair. <laughs> yep. That's pushes the bounds of realism just a little. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, in terms of like, what even is this episode? This is, I'm, I'm thrown immediately and we get a little more clarity as time goes on, but we're not seeing all these Davids in the same timeline as each other. And yet we kind of are. And mm -hmm. the way that we cut, like on the first watch, the way that we see homeless David and then it pans over to David in a car driving past and then it pans over to, like, I was one, and it pans over to Coffee David. I was wondering, like, are these three existing on the street next to each other? Are they going to bump into each other? Like, there's a cutless transition from one David to another. Yeah. That I think... The immediate effect is disorienting, is like how many Davids are walking around on this street. But the thematic effect, even after you've understood that, oh, these aren't existing in the same street in that way, the thematic effect of connecting them also has the effect of like, but they are connected. Mm -hmm. Where they're connected because it's all, all the same actor. It's always David, but it's really emphasizing the way that... These are, there aren't breaks between these characters. There aren't breaks between these versions of David. They're all one continuity or mm -hmm. they're all one like possibility or whatever. I don't know. The, the connection between them established by the cutlass transition between them is like the difference between them is, is permeable, not solid. Yes. The difference between them is fluid not abrupt, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like watching this, you can really see where our David that we know so well could become any of, could have become any of these. Yeah, for sure. You can really see, I especially feel like with mustache David who lives with his sister and takes lots of pills, feels just ever so slightly off from the David we know. Mm -hmm. It feels like just a, tiny decision led to that yeah and not necessarily it's one of the interesting things is i think we are meant to take away that it is mostly his decisions that we're looking at but there's an extra layer of like not necessarily his decision mm -hmm. like a tiny decision maybe of his maybe of everybody else also has these infinite possibilities yeah. and their infinite possibilities affect him too. And definitely of Amy's decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Is whether That's Amy puts him in a mental institution, whether Amy abandons him entirely, which I assume with the homeless David, that's an abandonment of Amy or death. Right. Like she's not there for him. Well, and when we see him sitting on a bench with her face on it, like she's yeah. not dead. 
That's true. Uh, but she's not helping him anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's plausible. Yeah, it does. It does feel very plausible. There's a moment when um, when Mustache David is stacking these boxes at the dairy. Mm-hmm. And it focuses on they're all facing green out. And there's one that's facing white out. And he stares at it. And he, and he turns it to the right way. Or turns it to the matching way. Yep. And I felt like that was metaphorical, that this David is, he knows he's different, but he's turning himself to be, to fit, like everybody else. It's himself who's... He is the white box who then has to turn to be green. Yeah, and he's wearing green at the time. Mm-hmm. And Amy, throughout this episode, almost always is wearing her usual green. Yep. Except in the flashback where she's wearing pink as she was the first time. Mm -hmm. When uh, Coffee David walks into the company carrying all the coffees, the company he works for, I didn't catch, even on the third watch, I didn't catch the name of the company, but its logo is a great big D. It's Davidoff is the name of the company. Davidoff? Davidoff. Huh. Which is a bit weird, but that, yeah. That's a David weird off. name for a company. Yeah. Also, I guess, David Off. Yep. Um, I, I'd have to look at it again, but I'm pretty sure it said David Off and then like Industries or something right. like that. And his logo is a big D and we've noticed these recurring Ds throughout the mm-hmm. season. And here's another one. I was hoping for a, a triple. triple D that we were missing, but mm-hmm. it wasn't. It was a single D. Speaking of mustachio David, though, he works for a dairy. The boxes that he's stacking have a picture of a cow on them. Mm-hmm. There's the cow again. There's the cow again. And in Billionaire David has a horse. Yes. There's like a random like horse in his downstairs area by the pool. Who yeah. wants a horse by a pool? You don't want a horse by a pool. You can lead a <laughs> horse to water. I'm more thinking of the manure situation, but yeah. yes. <laughs> so there's our, there's our farm animals again. And like, I don't know, there was an episode that had a pig. There was an episode with a cow. Now there's a horse. There, there was an animal in the last episode. And what am I forgetting? There was the horse that took Lenny back to... Oh, yeah. There was another horse. Yeah. Farm animals. For some reason. For some reason. And once again, in this episode, both a cow and a horse are are present in this episode. Mm-hmm. Including in the diner, where the scabby David is. Yes, there's a cow on the wall there in the art, or in the decor. And they're eating waffles. Oh, yeah! Which I thought was kind of funny. And then when he flashes to suburban life, the kids are like, waffles! And... The dad and David as the dad is all, let's have waffles. Yay. And like the constants David. in David's life are waffles. Yep. Possibly Amy and homeless David sees Sid drive by at one point. Yep. Mustachio David though. Mm-hmm. He is so absent. Really absent. Really out of it. And it's like, I agree what you said about it. It's, one of the easiest to see how we could have led to that path. Like some of the, it's, I can see how he could have become the coffee David, but there's some things that are hard to get past, you know? Yep. You know, you can kind of see it. But Mustachio David just seems so in such a very small step away from the David we've already seen. And it's really uh, heartbreaking How he's like, I guess he's, you know, at least he has a life with a sister who cares about him, but he doesn't care that he's in it. Mm. You know? Absolutely. Um, And we have, when we have the coffee, David. Mm Mm-hmm. It was funny to me how invested I was in wanting coffee david to like succeed when like this is not the david that i this is not a reality that i care about why am i invested at all in it but when he's trying to persuade his boss laura i'm like come on believe him don't say you're psychic she won't believe you now it's funny how uh 
quickly I'm emotionally invested in the success of this David who has no stakes. Yeah. But because you already love this character, so you want him to do well. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter about reality. Yeah. So we see a brief flash of David's childhood, and then we relive the scene from chapter two when Amy was telling David about Ben going to propose. In a file room, David does paperwork when a mouse appears and sings Slave to Love to him. (laughs) It is weird. (laughs) That's a little bit of editorializing. Uh Sorry, I couldn't keep from laughing. It's a super weird part. Young homeless David talks to himself and finds a shopping cart. We get a brief flash of him and Benny riding the cart down the, down the alley. As he goes down the street, he locks eyes with Sid in the backseat of a car. Old homeless David pushes his cart to an underpass where he eats and falls asleep. Four men approach and mock him and then beat him. As he lies there, he glows and then wipes them out, leaving only shadows. Mustache David sits listening to headphones as Amy arrives home. She talks to him about work, and he asks not to take any more pills. He doesn't want to be treated like a child. Mm-hmm. So back to this flash that we see, or this whole scene that we see from s- chapter two. I went back and rewatched, and this is literally the exact same scene. Like, it's just lifted. Right. Shot for shot, like they didn't remake it or anything. Mm-hmm. But I noticed something that I almost didn't even want to mention because I felt like it was too small and weird and like overanalyzing. But that's the kind of show we do. So <laughs> this is what we'll do. <laughs> it's Amy's talking about Ben proposing. She says that David can have that kind of life. And then it pauses, we hear a dog bark, which we know as the, it's King the dog who doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But then we also hear a couple of notes of a music box. And it's, and now as we know, a music box is associated with Sid. Right. And so we have this moment of David hearing his future almost we have him pausing to see to in between Amy saying you could have this life and him saying N- with Philly and him saying no no I couldn't I can't and then he goes into like he's sick but is the reason he can't because with Philly is because he has another someone in his future and that's Sid. So does that suggest that? He can have that kind of life with Sid? I don't know. Not really. <laughs> because the kind Frank... of life that he's having with Sid that we see is not the kind of life that Amy's describing. Exactly. That is true. And it makes me wonder if, like, I don't actually think so at all. But it makes me wonder if, like, well, is Amy, I mean, sorry, is Sid like King? In David's head. Whoa, no. That's... Whoa. (laughs) That's why I connect the dog bark and the music notes. Hmm. They're right next to each other, and they're like, well, there was a dog that we thought was real and isn't, and now there's music notes that indicate a girlfriend. I don't think so, actually. Mm Mm-hmm. But there's... That's what comes in my mind when you connect... When you connect the music notes to Sid, Hmm. I start to wonder. Yeah. That's crazy. I forgot to mention uh, the scabby-faced David who was discussing the multiple worlds theory. Um, his shirt that he's wearing is was Lenny's shirt, right? With the, the tri- with the triangle. Is it or is it an upside down version of it? Oh, I thought it was the same. I thought that Lenny's is the point is up. And Scabby David, the point is down. Mm, No, I think it's the same. Okay. From what I remember. Have to look back to be sure. Yeah. Hmm. So. The mouse? What what is up with this singing mouse? (laughs) He's Cinderella? (laughs) 
He's... Uh, no, he's the beast. Right, he's the beast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes? As throughout this entire show, the question, of course, is... Is the camera showing us something that's really happening, or is the camera merely showing us what David sees? I don't think it's very likely that a mouse actually stood up and started singing Slave to Love. <laughs> no, so definitely not. Kind of for the first time in this whole show. I think that's the first moment where I think what the camera's showing us is not what's literally happening. Well, that happens again and again, because the devil with yellow eyes. The devil with that? yellow eyes is, uh, other people can't see him, but I think he's there. Mm. Good right? Point. Yeah. It's not okay. the same thing in my mind. Like, I feel like the devil with yellow eyes, we can naively read it as if it's the same. It's a hallucination, but we gradually discover that it wasn't a hallucination. It's a psychic entity that really exists, right? Right. It's one of the things that makes the show so weird is that we're seeing things that we are trained to interpret as, oh, we're the camera showing us his hallucinations, and then it turns out, no, this is really what's happening. Or David has mind control powers. He can control <laughs> people and objects and things. And so... <laughs> He makes a mouse dance. He makes a mouse dance. Yeah. He's got a song stuck in his head. And so he just makes this mouse dance for his amusement. Head cannon accepted. <laughs> I believe that that is what we see. Yeah. I mean, later on, we're going to see this David huffing like liquid paper or whatever. White out. <laughs> and so I assume this is all fairly drug induced or like, you know, high. But, but, but no. Yep. Yeah. Well, hi, he makes a mouse sing for him. Yeah. I'm going to accept that. <laughs> I think right. I think that that mouse, actu if someone else had walked into the room at that point, they would have found a mouse actually singing. Yeah, I'm I gonna, think so. I'm going to accept your, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the weirdest moments in the whole show. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And therefore one of my favorite moments of the whole show. <laughs> well, I just kept going like, because this show was the kind of show to do it, I kept being worried, like, was that mouse going to be, like, stapled? He was singing next to a stapler, was, like, David or someone else going to, like, whack the mouse with the stapler? And I was, like, a little terrified. I had, but, but yeah. no, he didn't. I had all kinds of things, like, what's going to happen with this mouse? Is he going to, I don't know why this was in my head, but I was like, is he going to suddenly reach out and grab it and, like, bite its head off or something? Yeah. I thought he was going to bite the mouse for some reason. That was, mm. I was just like expecting him to suddenly lash out violently at the mouse. But no, he just <laughs> no. enjoys a little he serenade. Enjoys a little serenade. <sighs> so we do get this tiny little blink in your, you'll miss her, Sid. I don't think it's, I mean, I know why you say blink and you miss her because she's only on screen for two seconds. Yeah. But I think we get her so slow motion and so portentous. We're drawing every bit of attention that we can to her. Yes, that's a good point. And she's in the back seat of the car that looks a lot like the town car that Summerland has yeah. that took her away in the first place. So in this reality, is this Sid at this moment being taken away by Summerland? That's what I think. Yeah, that seems plausible. She looks different. She's got different hair and stuff. But yeah, basically, that's what I think is happening. So what is it like... Um... Why do we see Sid and David making eye contact in this scene? Well, it is really interesting that we don't see anyone else. We see Carrie eventually. We do see Carrie. Yeah. But I feel like it just shows the inevitability of Sid and David. That even if they don't meet, they still cross paths. And they still, when they cross paths, like, they have a moment. Yeah, exactly. Right? They don't just pass each other on the street. Mm -hmm. They have a moment, even when he's homeless and she's in a car driving past and they can't speak to each other. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. It speaks to like a sense of inevitability, a sense of 
uh, you know, fated lovers. And yet, even though they're quote unquote inevitable, they don't evitable. Yeah, in any of these timelines. So like their connection is transcends multiple dimensions, but it doesn't always actually lead to a relationship. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting kind of philosophical statement on the nature of inevitability, right? Yep. That just because something's inevitable doesn't mean it's going to happen, if you know what I mean. <laughs> if I know what you mean. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I Does so. anybody? <laughs> Did those words that came out of my mouth make sense to humans? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. We have the, like, this is the moment, too, uh, right before he meets Sid or sees Sid, is, like, the origin story. This is a superhero origin story of uh, Homeless David's shopping cart. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and this is where first, like, I make a bit of a joke about Homeless David's shopping cart, but this is the first time that we see that, like, some of these multiple Davids are the same one in different time periods. Yes, absolutely. Right? And yet, they're not. And I feel like one of the tricks that the show is playing on us in these moments of like, and he gets the shopping cart, and then now we see him with the shopping cart, is our first reaction is to say, oh, so young homeless David is old homeless David, except that, well, they're all the same David. Yep. Right? So young homeless David finds a shopping cart, then... uh finds some money on the street, uses it to get a shower and a suit, gets a job as a coffee boy. Like, we don't know that that's not the direction from this shopping cart, David, right? Yeah, exactly. Or immediately gets hit by a truck. Or immediately gets hit by a truck. Or, like, it's a uh, red herring, this connecting, oh, young homeless David is old homeless David. Coffee shop David is billionaire David. Well, no, they're all the same David. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. And I feel like the show is offering us these tantalizing red herrings of like, let's let's smooth out the timeline so that there's only three or four things we have to keep track of. But the whole point of the episode is there's billions of possibilities and they can depart and then reconnect and reconvene or not. And like... Mm-hmm. Those branches have branches and those branches have branches. Yeah, exactly. So, Paul. So, Jan. Have you seen A Clockwork Orange? Uh, I host a podcast named Clockwork, so I probably should. I think, I mean, I've, I have probably seen it. Uh, that doesn't mean I watched it. Like, it has been on in my presence. I've seen parts of it, certainly. Uh, I don't know that I've ever sat down and watched the whole thing beginning to end. But, I have seen it enough to recognize That those uh, guys walking down the street wearing like a bowler hat and beating uh, him up struck me as familiar. Same here. I have never seen The Clockwork Orange, but I've heard plenty about it. And I know the general uh, thing of it. I did not immediately recognize this scene as being lifted from Clockwork Orange And so when I, I think we retweeted from the Clockworks Twitter account, this picture of comparing Clockwork Orange and this episode. And I went, oh, maybe I need to watch that scene. And so I I watched just that scene on YouTube and like, oh, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So like we started, we watched the episode and I saw the bowler hat and was like, oh, those guys are kind of Clockwork Orangey. And then I looked at the credits, and they're credited as Droogs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, that sounds familiar. And I looked that up, and that, the Droogs are the, is like slang for uh, the gang members in Clockwork Orange, who are the main, like, protagonists. So I was like, oh, it definitely is a Clockwork Orange reference. And then we saw that picture that we retweeted, and then you looked up the scene, and... When you watch the whole scene, like, take us through, actually. What do you mean it's lifted from it? Well, it's not exactly the same, but some of the things that David says, like, it's the four guys approaching a homeless man, and the homeless man's singing and doing other things, but he says things like, I 
kill me, I need to be killed, I... There's man on the moon, man going around the earth. Like, he just says all this nonsense stuff, but David says the same things. Specifically, the, like, end my life, I don't want to live on this earth anymore. We have a man on the moon and men orbiting this earth, but we don't give no care to law and order anymore. Mm -hmm. On this earth. And, like, the exact lines. Yeah. So it's more than just a, you know... Passing, passing wink. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a reimagining. It's a, a alternate world version of Cro- Clockwork Orange. Mm-hmm. This isn't just an alternate world version of Legion. It's a multiple world version of Clockwork Orange. What if the droogs from Clockwork Orange came ac- across an old man to beat him up and it was a mutant who evaporated them? Yep. Disintegrated them. Probably better than evaporated. <laughs> and when he does, he like glows and zaps them and their shadows remain on the ground. Yeah, that's really creepy and really cool. And like for several shots, like he makes shadows. Yep. Yep. And this is I mean, all of these versions of David we assume still have the Shadow King inside of him. Right? I mean, that was the question. I I had written that down in my notes as a question to ask near the end. But since you bring it up now, they all have the Shadow King, right? Like, without Summerland, David never discovers Farouk and gets him out. So this The old... only way there wouldn't be a Shadow King inside of him is in a reality where he never came into him in the first place. Yeah. But we know for sure that Rich, David has him inside because he's looking, that happens a little bit later, but he's looking at Farouk. We know that Mustache Guy still has him because he has the devil with yellow eyes later. We know. And we don't know, but we can uh, kind of strongly speculate. Like when old homeless man David, when the Droogs first approach him, he says... Did he send you? Yep, exactly. Who is he? Yep. If not the Shadow King. I think that old homeless man David doesn't understand that the Shadow King is in his head, but he does understand that the Shadow King, like, is haunting and hunting him. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, in all these versions, the Shadow King, I postulate, in every one of these versions, the Shadow King is still... A parasite. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, Mustache David mm-hmm. is listens to headphones with jungle sounds. Yeah, and did you more crickets? Did the did the headphones look familiar to you? Were those Lenny's headphones? I didn't go back and watch the episode again, so I can't say a hundred percent. They sure looked very familiar. They sure were strongly reminiscent of Lenny's headphones. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure they were exactly the same, but they were definitely reminiscent. The The logo on the sides, I don't remember her having that. It looks like a Pepsi logo. They look like the headphones that Lenny puts on Sid's ears. Yeah, similar. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Are those the same as the headphones that Lenny was listening to when Lenny really was Lenny? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Even if they are not literally the same headphones, they're very close to the same design and they're a uh, visual echo. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a visual echo of that scene. And he's sitting there listening to cricket sounds and other jungle sounds. And in the episode where Lenny puts those headphones on Sid's ears and plays crickets, the purpose of the crickets is to placate her and uh, anesthetize her. Yeah. And here exactly. we have a placated and anesthetized David listening to crickets. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a, the same effect, the same purpose. Uh, and if we know that the Shadow King is in David's head, it may even be the same person who's pla- who's uh, placating him. Yes, that's really true. I love this scene where... Amy is like, I bought a pot pie. I got cookies and cream. 
And he's like, stop treating me like I'm six. And she's like, okay, well, I won't give you the ice cream. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. you know? Like, it's kind of a really sweet scene between David and Amy. It is. And I mean, I can see where this, if this episode represents David making a choice of what life he might live, I can see where this life would be very tempting. A life where his sister takes care of him. Yeah, exactly. And they're together. Mm-hmm. And she's always looking out for him. Yeah. And where he has no responsibilities. Exactly. He's not off saving the world in this world. Right? The temptation of Mustachio David is partly having someone to be with him and take care of him. And connected to that is just like... He's absent and checked out and that's... uh itself is very tempting, mm -hmm. especially at this moment for David. Yeah, exactly. Like, he'd have to be checked out, but his sister would still be alive. Yeah. So when Amy's trying to convince Mustachio David to take the pills, he says, you don't, she says, you don't want to hurt anyone, hurt me. Did Mustachio David hurt da Amy? Is that what we read into that exchange? I think so. Or hurt several people and not her and she doesn't want him to hurt her as well because what we've seen the david that we're familiar with hurt dr Poole. yes and himself we don't know about him hurting anyone else we certainly don't know about him ever hurting amy mm -hmm. that was a really i mean that was that was a Sobering moment. Yes, absolutely. Rich David signs a document to make him the richest man in the world. <laughs> his former boss is now his assistant and he reads her mind. He talks about being God's chosen vessel and that he knows what's in everyone's hearts. He talks to Amy about her wanting a new house and flexes his power on her, causing a nosebleed. Later, he stares in a mirror as women dance behind him, and Farouk appears in the mirror looking back at him. Old homeless David sits muttering to himself as Division Three commandos approach. He pushes them away with his power and tries to walk away, but they paralyze him with a high-pitched drone. Carrie approaches with a sword, and she slices him in half. So we see here that uh, Billionaire David is the future of Coffee Boy, Boy David, except sort of maybe not, like I said before. Yeah. Um, and he gives his whole speech about uh, power, and it's not about the money, it's about the power, and I'm going to change the world. And <laughs> Laura very unconvincingly says, you're, you're a saint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel like a second later we're going to see that he's looking in the mirror and Farouk is looking back but like that sure sounds like a villain monologue it really does it. it really does and it's like the kind of villain who thinks he's doing good yeah the kind of villain who goes I'm going to unite everyone I know everyone's thoughts and feelings and I'm going to do good because of that and you're like maybe you're a villain though yeah. And he says, when he says, like, uh, gone is the separation, gone is the division. Yeah. As in division three. That's an interesting play on words. And the divisions in general, gone is the division. Yeah. I'm going to unite everything. You unite everything by uh, erasing the divisions that, like... I mean, uniting everyone it seems very utopian, but it also is literally the stated goal of fascism. Yes. <laughs> like, divisions are necessary. Mm hmm I just, like, I never, it had never occurred to me until this time of, like, the divisions as the opposite of being united or even just, like, as... The mathematical concept of division. Yeah. And like the little logos they have on their backs or on their helmets and stuff. It looks like a domino. It's like 
two divided by one. Hmm. I or one divided by two are the dots. Until you just said that right now, uh, this is like, maybe we're going too far, but this is our show. Um, division, the symbol of a division is a line with two dots. What's the symbol of multiplication? An X. <gasps> so division is the opposite of X. Okay, that totally is a thing. <laughs> I can't believe we've never thought of that before. I can't believe we've never thought of that before. Because it totally is. Division is the opposite of time. Oh, man, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Legion just continues to always blow our minds. It sure does. And it's all, as always, it has now given us an out for, like, conspiracy or coincidence. Well, it could be a coincidence, but it could be a conspiracy, and we'll just see whatever we want to see, because we're humans. Yeah, I'm going to see the pattern, even if you didn't put it there. Yeah. Because it's there, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, excuse the foul language. <laughs> cool. um, Thank you. So then David goes down, his sister is here. Yeah. I'm like, this version of Amy, good gravy. Yeah. This is not a happy version of Amy. Certainly isn't. Her husband sleeping with his masseuse, but so is she. Uh, and then David, like, she asks for another house and David gives her a nosebleed. Yeah. This and is the, evil, David. Like, if his villain monologue wasn't villainy enough, this is the moment where, like, this is a step beyond uh, misguided, well-intentioned villain who thinks that he's the hero this is like also petty and we just saw amy as someone who is always supporting him and protecting him when he is in need when he's mustachio david amy is there for him and helping him and getting him ice cream and doing giving her life dedicating her life to uh caring for him mm -hmm. and when he's the one who has power he gives her a bloody nose yeah he's pretty horrible to her it makes it hard to i mean it makes it hard to think of david as anything but the villain of this piece yeah definitely and then we see you know that he's looking at his the mirror and we see farouk and maybe this is a glimpse of like what happens when farouk has power um yeah, I think so. And especially, like, the random women, like, dancing in the background, in his pool, all around. Like, that's very, that's what Farouk has from what we've seen. Yeah, true. That's connected to Farouk. Um, I mean, like, also in his conversation with Amy, she asks, why does he keep Laura around? And he says, she resents me. I like it. Yeah. Somehow it's the, like, the pettiness is more villainous, or it hits home more as villainy than the grandiose. Hmm. You know? I agree. When old, so moving on to old homeless David, mm -hmm. he's sitting on this, like, concrete planter or whatever, and he says, it's always blue. He, like, shouts it. Yeah. And that's a line from Lenny. Yeah. About drugs, about like the drugs are always blue. And so we have this weird these callbacks to like the first episode, the second episode. Except that like Yeah, it was Benny. Except that it was Benny, you're right. Who said it was always blue, really? Yeah. I mean and the question, one of the questions that this begs is, at what point do we start branching? Like, we see flashbacks to him trying to hang himself and to uh, Amy taking him to the hospital. Do we assume that the branching that leads to all the versions that we see in this episode all happens after those flashbacks? Or not? Because I kind of think that the flashbacks, I kind of think one of the things the flashbacks are doing for us is they're showing us that, like, this stuff has happened. And after this point, David starts making different choices and it leads to these different scenarios. 
I don't know. I feel like co- the coffee getting David mm. is so much more confident and ve- so very different from any David le- leading up to him. And old homeless David could have gone so far as to be in clock in, in Summerland and leave. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so not necessarily what we saw. Like, what we saw before the show started uh, hasn't happened in all the timelines. Yes. No? <laughs> I'm not really sure what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> an old homeless David, uh, it makes me, when he's, like, throwing people around and the army is all coming in, it's like, first of all, uh, in this world, people are aware of mutants, right? Mm, yeah. Even in the timeline a of summerland there are people who are aware of mutants like that's why division three exists Mm -hmm. right uh timeline a uh you know our main legion world yeah people are aware of mutants feels like uh for homeless david this is not even particularly covert anymore Mm -hmm. and they recognize him as a powerful mutant for disintegrating the droogs. Yeah. And it makes me think of Melanie's conversation with Clark at the end of season one, that David's a world breaker. And like, it's very shocking when Carrie cuts his head in half with a sword. Yes. Or his whole body even. Yep. But also like. That's how they deal with him. That's how they would deal with him. And like, I don't know, maybe that was necessary in this timeline. Mm -hmm. Because he's powering up and how many people is he going to kill now? Yeah. Uh, Last time he killed just the four people who were beating him up. But like, there's going to be more this time, right? Yep. We see the scene from chapter one where David hangs himself. Mm -hmm. Then a flash of old Amy washing David in the bath as jungle noises play. Mustache David walks out of a dairy and sees the devil with yellow eyes. Police approach him asking for ID and he keeps seeing the devil. They attempt to arrest him and Amy arrives but he freaks out and uses his power. He sends one officer flying and kills another. More police arrive and shoot him, but he annihilates the entire block, leaving nothing but shadows and Amy. Old David is helped out of the bath and into a wheelchair. We see flashes of David as a child, him in the, pu- in the file room sniffing liquid paper, in the diner with his wife and kids in a pool and as a baby then amy walks in a graveyard and places flowers on david's grave the grave reads taken too soon we then see in amy's car david in his striped shirt begging not to go to clockworks amy tells him it will just be a few weeks he gets out of the car and amy cries And we see the progression of David's life as we know it in Clockworks in Summerland. We then see Farouk saying that David can decide what is real and what is not. And we're again at the last shot of the last episode in the room with Lenny. So old David listening to jungle sounds is the same jungle sounds as mustachioed David listening to jungle sounds. Yep. I really think, like, I mean, like you said, it doesn't really matter, but it also feels like old David is the same as the mustache David because he gets shot. And so this day, like old David is injured. Something is wrong with him. And he also has so many pills in his home. Yep. And Amy is taking care of him. Yep. So this is kind of the timeline of what happens this way. Yep. 
that's the future of he's been shot and he's got some kind of spinal injury. Mm-hmm. And he has lots of uh, pills to repress his illness. Yeah. Oh, so, so when Mustachio David is outside his job and it's night and he's like all confused and then the police pull up, he sees the devil with the yellow eyes in the police car. And this is where I, I, you know, think once again that the devil with the yellow eyes is still haunting David in all these timelines. Anytime he doesn't go to Summerland, he still has the devil with the yellow eyes haunting him. Absolutely. Um, and David, when the cops come out and they're like harassing him and we can maybe back up to that in a sec, but David uses his powers to throw them all away and he crushes the one cop just like how Lenny crushed Walter. Yeah, exactly the same way. Because the Shadow King is in control of David or is influencing David. Mm -hmm. And he acts just as the Shadow King would. Again. Yep, exactly. Here, just like Billionaire David is acting just like the Shadow King, now Mustachio David is acting just like the Shadow King. Mm -hmm. I love the moment where the police ask for ID and he just kind of pulls his coat aside and points to his name tag that says David. Aww. And it's sweet and, oh, it's kind of, it's so heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. What this, I mean, like, I'm going to get too real for a second. And, like, this scene was really, really upsetting because we know from the news that all too often this is the spirit of how police interact with people with mental illness. I mean, it's... Noah Hawley is is holding a mirror up. Oh, it's so upsetting. And you've seen videos that don't that depart from this at some point, but you've seen like YouTube clips that someone took of their phone of this is how police act too often. And it's really, really upsetting because he was harmless until you made him harmful. Mm-hmm. Oh I that's just uh that made me quite upset. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. I think it does. I think it, it was a necessary scene. Yeah. To have, I think that Noah Hawley is really saying something with that. Yeah. And I think it's important that he included that, even though it was upsetting to watch. Yep, yeah, for sure. And then what David uh, does to the cops, just like old homeless David, he does like a ring of fire Mm -hmm. and turns them into shadows. Yep. Including their cars. Including their cars. And here's where I say what I bit my tongue from saying the first time, which is the shadows. He's the shadow king creating shadows. Yeah. And then we have... Oh. Yeah, and then we see how... uh, Amy ends up spending the rest of her life taking care of David. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, this big contrast to what happens when Amy is the one with power and what happens when David is the one with power. Uh, Or when the Shatter King's the one with power. That, like, when he has power over her, he humiliates and hurts her. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting, um, Amy being David's nurse, old Amy Hmm. being old David's nurse. Because think back to Mental Clockworks, and when Amy was David's nurse, she was sadistic. Yeah, that's true. And here we see her so kind. Mm -hmm. There's also a real connection here in old, bald, completely bald David being put into a wheelchair. And you just have this shot of him bald and sitting in a wheelchair, looking like his father. Yeah, they couldn't get uh, Patrick Stewart to play old David. <laughs> <laughs> he isn't Professor X. <laughs> no, but people look like their fathers sometimes. No, that's true. It would be confusing, though. It too, would be. Too confusing. Too okay, confusing. fair enough. But yeah, it's clearly a reference to Professor X. Yes. Which I loved. 
And the scene outside clockworks in the rain. David wearing his striped prison shirt. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to go to clockworks. And all of that scene is uh, poignant, but the line that stood out, stood out to me the most strongly, especially as it relates to the theme of the whole episode, is David says, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Yeah. And Amy says, but it is. But it is. Because this is the world as we know it for David. And I think this is uh, a turning point for David about Farouk in a second, like after it wasn't supposed to be like this, but it is. We get flashbacks of Farouk saying, you can decide, your will can decide what's real. And that's right next to Amy saying, how it is is how it is. Mm-hmm. And and uh, those are alternative philosophical positions for David to consider. Yeah. Uh, can you change the world just because you want to? And if you can, is it right for you to do so? And that brings us to, I think... The whole issue with time travel and future Sid. Because future Sid is saying the world is the way it shouldn't be. Change it. And what's the difference between David changing future Sid's reality by uh, helping the Shadow King and David changing present David's reality by changing his choices? Like we're seeing in this episode something really connected to the theme of the whole season of going back and changing the past to affect the future. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Well, and we know future Sid has said about the Shadow King, or about Farouk, you're going to bash his brains in in the desert in a couple of weeks. And at that point, we were like, really? But at this point, I'm like, yeah, I can really see that. Yep, this is what happens to lead to that. Is this, is Legion becoming a villain origin story for David? Well, that's a question. Like, if we're looking back on this whole episode, this is connecting all the different Davids. And, like, in how many of these scenarios is David a villain? Yeah. Or doing Mo- villainous things. Most of them. Mm-hmm. How many times, twice, he, like, lets off an explosion and kills a bunch of people. Mm Mm-hmm. And those are not the most villainous version of him. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, the least of the Davids that we spend any substantial time with, the least villainous one is the one where he's, you know, sniffing uh, whiteout and watching mice dance. (laughs) And that... uh, isn't exactly villainous, except who asks for whiteout mm-hmm. like, or uh, liquid paper? Yep. Lenny, the first thing he, she says to, one of the first things she says to Clark is, hey, do you have any liquid paper? So of all things for David to be getting high on, liquid paper is maybe connecting him again to the Shadow King in that scenario. Yep. But uh, especially for the audience connecting him to Lenny. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, like, uh, Suburban David is basically benign, and uh, Whiteout David is basically benign, I guess. Mm -hmm. Scabby David seems like that is shorthand for meth addict. uh, Yeah, or something. Is basically benign, I guess, only harming himself. But all the other ones are causing, like, massive harm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah... Is this an, is this entire show a villain origin story? It's hard to finish this episode and not see David as at least potentially the villain of this story. Mm-hmm. Or at least a revenge seeker. Yeah, certainly a revenge seeker. Like he ends like I'm the previous episode was I'm coming for you. Yeah. At the end, like he's going to kill Farouk if he can. Mm hmm. But even apart from revenge, like, we see, if you count the revenge, we see four different method, four different scenarios in which David's a villain. Right? Yeah. 
Is this essentially an extra episode? Like, we end this episode in the exact same place as the previous episode. Why was this episode necessary? Why was the episode in Sid's head necessarily? We ended that basically in the same place as we started. Yeah, I'm asking about this one. (laughs) (laughs) Because the story isn't... Because the story isn't the point. Mm Mm-hmm. It's all about the journey, man. It's all about the journey. And in fact, uh, I would even go so far as to say, plot is never the point of a story. That is to say, in the sense of how everything ends up and like, well, you could just get them there. It's always about plot in the sense of what they go through on the way there. Which is to say, it's always about character and symbolism and theme and motif. And it's never, who cares about if you, if there's just a point A and a point B and you skip the stuff in the middle, there's no story that's worth telling. Mm-hmm. I like, this is an episode of TV that's in the tradition of, like, the uh, Gonzo episodes, right? Yeah. It's like uh, Normal Again, episode of Buffy. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, the Riker is in a mental, institu- mental institution and his life on uh, the Enterprise was all a fantasy all along. Yeah. Uh, there's a long tradition of this kind of episode of a series. I feel like this is, they, at their worst... Like, the Riker episode of Star Trek uh, is a lot of fun, but also feels like I there's no point at which I believe that maybe Riker was in a mental institution all along. And even the Buffy episode, most people watch it and think, oh, it ends with her being in the mental institution. But I'm, I feel like, yeah, but... I don't care about that Buffy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's the quote unquote real, but I don't care about her. I care about the Buffy you've shown me all along. Mm -hmm. I feel like this episode is doing something a little bit different where like, I wouldn't have put it totally past them to end this episode with the status quo, not being the status quo anymore. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Like in a way that for no other show, did I believe that you were going to end the episode and, well, from now on, Buffy's in a mental mental institution. But I wouldn't have said it was impossible to end this show and, hey, from now on, David is, uh, or from the next couple of episodes, David is a boxer, like a stalking boy at a dairy. Yeah, yeah. You know? And the fact that they don't, the fact that they end back where they started, feels earned because it doesn't feel to me inevitable. Mm Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. I felt watching this episode like we could have ended not where we started. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we did isn't a default. It's a choice, both a writerly choice and a characterly choice. You know what I mean? Yep. Also, we went into Potonomy's maze Mm -hmm. and and Melanie's maze. Uh We went into Sid's head for a full episode. Uh And so this is David's head. Yeah. This is maybe, this is David's maze, is these options. I like it. And even if it's not the maze in the sense of the monk's maze. No. But it's analogous. Yeah. Yeah. There's some stories told in this episode. Mm, Yes. Specifically, the one I want to draw attention to is that billionaire David tells Laura the story of the Tower of Babel. Yes. And... One of the things that I think that uh, should mean to us, like we talked when we went past this moment about how billionaire David believes that he's uh, doing good for the world, but is actually, that's a villain monologue. And one of the signs that it's a villain monologue is that he's going to literally undo God's will, right? God created these divisions. He is profoundly misreading the Tower of Babel by suggesting that God has allowed, given me the ability to undo the Tower of Babel when his own reading of his own telling of the story should tell him that God created these divisions. Mm-hmm. That if you want to 
uh, appeal to the authority and good of God, then the Tower of Babel story is telling you that these divisions are God's will. Hmm. And undoing them is setting yourself up as an alternative to God, which is textually exactly what the Shadow King wants to do. And the whole point of the Tower of Babel story in the Bible is that people were building a tower up to God. And God uh, created languages and division so that they wouldn't ever reach the heights of heaven and replace God. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, the Tower of Babel is extremely significant to the Shadow King as someone who wants to build up a tower and replace God. And when he says that he's going to undo all the divisions, like the Hebrew scripture version of the Tower of Babel is about the dangers of hubris and the uh, uh, necessity of recognizing the power and authority of one greater than humanity. And that's exactly what the Shadow King wants to refuse to do. That's like his entire deal. Hmm. There are some songs in this episode. Yes, there are. The first one, uh, while we're kind of getting montages of the different Davids in the beginning of the episode, we have a song called I'd Love to Change the World by Jetta. Except not Jetta. It is a cover by Noah Hawley and Jeff Russo. And the lyrics, some of the relevant lyrics. Everywhere is freaks and harries, dykes and fairies. Tell me where is sanity? Tax the rich, feed the poor, till there are no rich no more. I'd love to change the world, but I don't know what to do, so I'll leave it up to you. Mm. And the line about... uh where is sanity lands exactly as David, uh, young homeless David is ranting to himself on the street. And we have, tell me where is sanity. It also connects to what old homeless David is saying about the world as it, when he's getting beat up by the droogs about like, no one cares about law and order in this world anymore. Yeah. Tell me where is sanity. There's a, theme of rich and poor that I'm going to come back to because it comes up again in the next song. But the most important, I think, thematic meaning of this episode, of this song, I mean, is just, I'd love to change the world, but I don't know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. David is spending this whole episode, I would love to change things. I don't know how. I don't know which, what would be a better alternative. And even the overall theme of the whole season is I'd like to change the world, but I don't know how. Exactly. He knows that the world needs to be changed. And not just him, like all of us. Yeah. All of our characters, I mean. Mm-hmm. The Mouse <laughs> sings Slave to Love by Brian Ferry. Um, some of the relevant lyrics. Tell her I'll be waiting in the usual place with the tired and weary. There's no escape. To need a woman, you've got to know how the strong get weak and the rich get poor. Slave to love, oh slave to love. Uh, So once again, rich and poor. Yeah. And we have the rich get, you know, we saw rich David and poor David. Yeah. So in these two of these songs and in the main body of the episode, we have commentary on rich and poor. Tax the rich and feed the poor till there are no rich no more. Billionaire David is the most villainous of all the Davids. Homeless David, uh, no one is helping him. And in this song, you've got to know how the rich get poor. I don't know what that all adds up to, but I do know rich and poor is like... This episode is very interested in rich and poor. Yep. And this episode is not on the side of the rich. No, definitely the most evil David is the rich David. Mm Hmm. I have absolutely no idea why Slave to Love is a song that the mouse sings. No. No. 
I don't think it it needs to have a reason. <laughs> so, like, I read some of the lyrics, but I don't know what it means. I don't know. The storm is breaking, or so it seems, is part of the lyrics. Hmm. But I don't know what that means, so I, I had to draw attention to it and read some of the lyrics. The rich and poor thing I have kind of thoughts about, but the song as a whole... I turn to you, our listeners. Why? What is Slave to Love? Why this song of all songs in the universe? Because there's a reason. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. Near the end montage, and especially as Amy is going to visit David's grave, we have uh, Henrik Gorecki's Third Symphony, the Symphony of Sorrowful Songs, hmm. and the Second Movement. And the words are, I think in Polish, he's Polish, and the words are in a language I don't know, um, but look Polish to me. But translated to English, the words go, No mother, do not weep. Most chaste queen of heaven, support me always. As Amy goes to visit David's grave. Yeah. And those are, in one sense, those are just appropriate mourning words. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a uh, significance to seeing Amy with the word support me always. Yes. When we have seen Amy supporting David in many of these timelines. And yep. we have seen that without Amy's support, David uh, collapses, yep. you know, into, into homelessness. And then finally, the over the... Very last montage and into the end credits, we have I Am Superman by R.E.M., but covered by Noah Hawley and Jeff Riso. I love this cover. It's fantastic. I, I like Noah Hawley and Jeff Riso's covers are always good. Uh, and they're always really appropriate to the moment of the episode of TV. But this is like, I think this is my favorite version of this song that I've ever heard Mm -hmm. is better than the R.E.M. version or I like it better. Yeah. I love this cover too. I'm right there with you. It's such a good cover of this song and I just want to have it on a, an album. I now at this point in the show, I have always wanted to have like the Legion uh, soundtrack just as an album in my house. But now I want an album that's, I want also to have an album that's just the Noah Hawley, Jeff Russo covers. Mm -hmm. Like make a whole album of that, please. And also an album that's the soundtrack with all everybody else's songs and have them be two different things. And I can have both of them. (laughs) (laughs) Who buys albums anymore? Is that a thing? Through iTunes. (laughs) Right. Okay. Gotcha. (laughs) This podcast is brought to you by iTunes. Apple. They are our dear and glorious leader. Um, I am Superman. Relevant lyrics. I am, I am Superman and I know what's happening. I am Superman and I can do anything. You don't really love that guy you make it with now, do you? You don't really love that guy because I can see right through you. I am Superman and I know what's happening. If you go a million miles away, I'll track you down, girl. Trust me when I say I know the pathway to your heart. Trust me when I say I know the pathway to your head. And we named our episode after this one. um, The version of it as sung by Noah Hawley is like... Not... uh, Triumphant... No. David has all this power. He can do anything. He's Superman in a Nietzschean, not a DC sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something kind of funny about a Marvel universe having the I Am Superman song. It is. It's, it's like they just don't acknowledge that Superman with a capital S even exists. So, no. <laughs> um. And we have, like, if you go a million way, miles away, I'll find you. I'll track you down. And the original song is, like, 
I guess, about a girlfriend or something, uh, or a romantic, uh, objective romantic affection. Stalker. Stalker. Like, it's stalkery. But in the context of this show, like, if you go a million miles away, I'll track you down, sister. But he won't. And he chooses not to or can't or he's gotten rid of her and we're singing I'm Superman and I can do anything and he's confronted against something he can't do. Mm-hmm. And it's heartbreaking. And it's one of the like ironies of this series and ironies of the show and the song the episode is that like he can control which reality he's in maybe but maybe he doesn't maybe he can't and there's no reality where he gets what he actually wants Mm -hmm. I can do anything but no he can't I know what's happening but no he doesn't yeah well that was quite an episode of Legion, to say the least. That was sure an episode of Legion. <laughs> so we got some feedback on this episode from the people on the Twitters. Uh, thanks for that. So uh, Omari Daniels at The Other Big O says, Could Rich David, being the most powerful man in the world, be the reality that Farouk would have wanted, since that would have been the perfect time to infect David and become even stronger? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I don't think that that's the moment that Farouk infects David. I think that's what happens if Farouk has in- never uninfected David, right? That's yeah. Farouk's endgame if no one stops him. Mm-hmm. If he was never stopped, for sure. I or, we, or it's kind of halfway through his endgame, like he's just about to become the, most, the richest man in the world and right. even more is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely is the world, the reality Farouk would have wanted. Mm-hmm. Melanie Turcott at Mel Gazuliant responds to Omri, Omari Daniels by saying, I think it is a timeline where Farouk somehow took over. The Babel Tower reference could only come from a guy that constantly switches from one language to the other. That's my theory on the matter anyway. And that's similar to what we were saying, like Farouk totally is in charge of billionaire David. How exactly that happens, I don't think is clear, but like, yeah, that's what happens when Farouk is running the show. Yeah. I didn't catch until uh, Melanie said it that the Tower of Babel is Farouk switching languages back and forth. Yeah, I really like that. That's a good, good call, is Babel Tower and him, he speaks all those languages. Yeah. Our last tweet comes from M is in Holly Hell at M L E Zoe One. I assume your name is Emily, maybe. <laughs> this episode was so profoundly sad and I loved it with lots of question marks. <laughs> I felt the entire episode spoke to how we, or even especially a powerful Omega level mutant, process grief and how memories of our loved ones can be quite painful, yet we choose to embrace them, hoping they will sustain us. And this is, I do feel like this whole episode is a love song to Amy. Yeah. It's a goodbye to Amy. Yeah. And I don't know if this actress will be on the show again. I really liked her. I'm sad if she's gone. But yeah, it is. Look at all, every single version of David has some version of Amy. And some version of Amy is important to who David is. Exactly. In all of these. I really like this, uh... Memories are of our loved ones can be painful, yet we choose to embrace them. Mm -hmm. And that connects, uh, in my mind, to patonomy. I like to think I'm a time traveler. Mm. And like, I went to an academic speech once, an academic talk once, where they talked about uh, the nature of history. And he said, like, history, time is not a straight line because the past only exists in our minds and we remember things in blobs. Uh, And he was arguing that, like, there isn't any past apart from memory. So it isn't a line that heads backwards. It's a profound moment and another profound moment. And they go in whatever order you want to. And that's what the past actually is. 
Mm. I feel like that's how Ptolemy sees things. Yeah. And I feel like emotionally that's really like the memories of our loved ones that are painful, but we embrace them because they, and we hope they'll sustain us is like so profound, Mm -hmm. profoundly uh, accurate to what it is like to be a person, (laughs) right? Yes, exactly. And it also is connected to uh, what Sid said about the world breaks all of us and some are strong at the broken places. The memories of our loved ones are painful, but we embrace them anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a bit of a different take on that. Our pain is what creates us. It's not so much about the pain creates scars they're calcified over as like, what if the pain, what if we embrace it instead? Mm -hmm. I totally agree. This was a sad and beautiful episode. I think uh, this is in high in the running. I know this is like a, a going to be a polarizing episode. Absolutely. I strongly suspect this is going to be a very polarizing episode and people will might, might hate it. Mm hmm. I think this is high in the running for my favorite episode of Legion ever. You were saying that it's, you were saying, I think on Twitter even, that like it's watchable by itself. Which I think so. I mildly question, but I think I can see what you mean by that. There's an additional level of understanding you get from knowing the show. But I think within this episode, it gives us everything we need to know about who Amy is and there's like the moments of Farouk you won't get if you have only watched this one episode. Mm-hmm. That especially the moment where old David is staring into the mirror and there's a mustachioed sunglasses wearing guy staring back at him. Yeah. That'll be out of nowhere. But other than that, a lot of this episode is very understandable on its own merits, without any previous knowledge of who these people are, I think. Especially because you have the Scabby David in the diner doing the multiple worlds theory. Yeah. So you can, that instantly you go, oh, that's what this is. It explains itself. Yeah. I think. But I would kind of, I would kind of recommend this episode to someone who wants to know what Legion is like, even though it's not the status quo at all. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're going to like Legion... You have to be comfortable with spending half the episode not knowing what's going on Mm -hmm. and comfortable with eventually it'll explain itself as much as it needs to. Yes, exactly. And if you don't like that, you're not going to like Legion at all. Yeah. Right? At first, this episode doesn't make any sense whether you've seen the episode, like, it's hard to understand what's happening, whether you've seen the whole show or not. And if you're not comfortable with that, you're never going to be sold on Legion. And I mean, like, who doesn't love a dancing mouse? I know. Who on earth doesn't love a dancing mouse? <laughs> I like. I looked over. We have a. <gasps> our kid has a hamster, and so its cage is in the living room. And I looked over at it while we were watching this episode, and I thought, "Why don't you ever sing and dance for us? Like, we just have a lame hamster who runs runs in a wheel." <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, but I have one last thing to say. I forgot to say before. Um. Our other podcast, Way Too Serious, serious. we talked this past week about Beauty and the Beast, the live action version, Mm -hmm. which happens to star Dan Stevens, aka David Holler. So if there is this multiple worlds theory, Uh does uh, a world where there's Beauty and the Beast fit into that? I think absolutely, without question. The, the the 2017 Beauty and the Beast is the uh, just part of this episode of Legion. I think it's deleted scenes from this episode of Legion. And if you want to hear more about that, uh, you should listen to our podcast about that movie. Because we talk about it in our podcast way too seriously. We talk about it and then it turns out we were even more right than we knew. We were even more right than we knew. It's serendipity. Or it's, you know... Get used to it. Being more right than you even knew. That's (laughs) just the curse of being us. Exactly. (laughs) So you can find that podcast 
by just searching way too seriously on your podcast searcher of choice. Or you can go to the website goodstuff.fm slash WTS. And back to Legion, I would love to hear any of your continued thoughts as some of you have already interacted with us about this episode as we read, but, you know, keep them coming. If you want to talk to us on Twitter, we are at ClockworksCast. If you want to talk to us at more length or privately, you can email us about your thoughts about this episode or any episode or this season or any season. And you can email us at clockworkscast at gmail.com. If you like this show, please rate and review us. And if you want us to continue to make stuff for your ear holes, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash clockworkscast, where any amount of support is enormously appreciated, helps us to make this show and other great shows, and also gets you our thanks and extra content that we make just for you to show our gratitude. So I've been Paul Moffat. I've been Jan Moffat. Goodbye.